Welcome to Accessing Life, a podcast focused on empowering people with developmental disabilities to live their best life. Your hosts are Chester Finn and BJ Stasio. A concern many people with disabilities have is that if they have a job, they lose their benefits. On this podcast, we'll tell you why that's not the case. Welcome to our podcast. Our guest is Sonam. Can you tell us a little bit about where are you from and what you do? Sure. So um, right now I'm back working at the Independent Living Center of the Hudson Valley under the guidance of Denise Figueroa and, and Karen Garofalo. And uh, that's located in Troy in Hudson, New York. And uh, I do benefits advisement and advocacy and anything that they need. I've worked for them in the past. Uh, then I went to the education department. Now I'm back working for them, and I'm really happy to help advance people to have good access to good benefits like Social Security and health insurance. So that's a large part of what I do in my my work day, as well as help people apply for Access VR. Okay, um, you said you help people to apply for um, Social Security. One of the one of the things that I know for you know advocating for people is you tell them about employment and jobs and the first thing that comes out of their mouths is oh well I can't work my benefits yeah. uh, can you explain a little bit about what you guys do at the independent living center or to you know help people with the problems with Social Security. Well, um, that's the other part of my job for the most part. I, we're basically, you, you need to assess with the person what is the nature of the problem and is there time sensitivity. So people have overpayments, this happens at times, or people have had challenges with reporting their wages. For people that are very new and want to try working, I provide uh, individualized work incentive education for both SSI and SSDI and explaining uh, how that all works and how you can hold on to your benefits if that's your goal and what how the Medicaid works with 1619B with retaining and a lot of it's providing numbers and working with people's learning style to understand something so important so people can more confidently say yes I can work or I can take more hours that sort of thing along with the special work incentives too. Sonam, thank you very much for being on the show. This is a very important topic to to myself and to other people watching this. And one of the things I've realized is that a lot of people listen to the people who tell them that if they get a job they want, they'll lose their benefits. I'm sure people have said that to you. What, what kind of advice would you give them? Well, first of all, BJ, thanks again to you and, and Chester and Michael for having me. Um, I I think the most important thing is to understand how it works. So what does that mean? So SSI and SSDI have different rules and regulations and things, and I really believe in the peer model. Sometimes I use myself as an example. I was on Social Security benefits from 1996 to 2004, although I zeroed out with my SSI sooner because SSI has its own rules that happens more quickly. So a lot of it is to do, if a person is not yet searching, to do uh, projections with desired income. So someone may say, I think I want to take a certain job. And it comes down to looking at the numbers so that people understand if they're on SSD, how, how does it work with the trial work months? Uh, how does it work with their bank account getting bigger? Uh, which it doesn't affect them. How does it work with the 36 months period of uh, and ex extended eligibility and expedited reinstatement so that a person understands if I, if I graduate myself off, what do I have to plan for? Um, SSI, it's very much arithmetic um, with some people. It's, it's just sitting down to understand the income disregard and understand, which is $87 for every $2 you earn, you lose a dollar and trying to help people understand it doesn't come out of your check, it comes out of your SSI, and there's a lag. So it's a budgeting education that has to happen, especially with SSI, so people can plan 
for the changes in their income. And do you think the fear sometimes gets in the way of making an informed choice? Yeah, I really do. Because first of all, it's so hard to get on in the first place for some people. Um, so you fear losing it because while it may not be very much money in some instances, especially with SSI, it's enough to keep your head above water. You know, it, it, it matters. It, it means if you're in a shared house, you can hold up your bills. So sometimes it's uh, working with families as well as individuals because the family will be concerned that, well, they're going to totally lose it. So explaining how being evaluated works and how important it is to, you know, fully tune into the rules, how it can be in your favor. Because it's possible to work and it's possible to retain your benefits. And up to a certain amount without my, I don't have my, my chart in front of me, but with 1619B, you can retain in New York State, you can retain your Medicaid making quite a bit of money up to a certain point. Uh, and so a lot of it is I will search with them and basically co-educate them to what I know and how they can continue to understand that information in a way that's going to make sense for them. Because everybody learns differently. But if you can understand what, how much you can earn and how the rules work, I think that helps. And letting people express what they're concerned about. Because people can only take the risk that they're ready to take. Yes, I think one of the biggest problems is that people don't know or understand what's available to them. And, you know, you talked about, you know, the Medicaid buy-in and things like that. People yeah. don't understand that these things are there to help you. You know, when I started working for OPWDD, I looked at, you know, first, I got an estimate of how much I would have. So I sat down and went over a budget and went over a budget. And then I, you know, moved from Western New York out here to Albany. And surprisingly enough for me, it was so different. I mean, I had uh, more money than I anticipated, you know, working with. And I was like, whoa. I hit the jackpot, but <laughs> I still had to, um, you know, work on that. And then, you know, I let Social Security know early and save some checks. And I said, you know, I don't need these anymore. And they said, what? Oh, it's, it's yours. You know, my whole thing was, well, I don't want you coming back to me saying that I owe you and taking my money, um, right. you know. And, you know, people don't understand that, you know, sometimes, you know, they make mistakes, you know, Social they Security yeah. makes mistakes and charge you for something that you really don't owe. But, you know, when they owe you, oh, this is all you're going to get, you know, I know. they're not going to give you any more, you know. Exactly. Well, I do certainly see my fair share of, of overpayments. I know when I was on the benefit system, they paid me for almost eight months afterwards. And um, one of my disabilities was very fatiguing. So all of my energy was being at work on time, doing my really good job, and then just going home. So I thought, I'm just not going to cash these checks. And in that instance, I shouldn't because I had gone through my trial work months. I had gone through my three months of grace period that comes after that and was in my 36 month period of extended eligibility for this is just SSD, mind you. So for that, I, I brought them back to them. They were so, they were so surprised because um, they were going to bill, you know, bill me otherwise. Um, and then there are some instances where people do report their wages. I'm a big believer, don't report by phone. That's kind of old school, but some people still do that. But you have no record when you've done that. And then it makes right. it harder to prove, right? You always want to yes. have a, a, a line of proof, right? You are yes. advocates, you guys know. Yes. I. I know um, working with, when I was doing some uh, training on, you know, Social Security, you know, working with some people in Washington and a guy that worked with us, he had been working for Social Security about 20 years 
And he said, the best thing you can do is keep saving your receipts and stuff and saving all the letters you got. He said, mm -hmm. keep the letters, make copies of them, because he was saying at the time, Social Security didn't keep good records. And if you had records to prove what you were saying and they didn't, there was no way that they could, you know, get after you if you, you know, was diligent and, you know, saving and making copies of things. I still live yeah. by that with other things. That's, that's smart. And I agree with that because it, in a way, I, I think of it as you're helping them to do better by you and helping them to help you because they have such high numbers so that it, you can demonstrate your own situation. Yeah, whether it's binders or keeping things in a box, a file box, whatever is going to make sense. Do you have any advice for, you know, younger people that are coming into the system that, you know, they've been told, you know, don't work, you know, just you're going to get your Social Security and your benefits and stuff? Well, it depends on how old, of course. Um, so if you're talking to someone under age 18, that's a family circumstance where you're educating family and youth at the same time and taking your time with it. Because family, especially, they have the voice with and over the under 18. So you have to turn to the under 18 and say, hey, what is it that you really want to do, though? Let's talk about how we can make it work. And that's the phrase. I think this can work for you, but let's talk about how we can make it work so that you can tell me if that's going to, if you think that will work for you. Um, and then for the over 18, it's sitting with them either by themselves or with a support person because it, it's, it's not about intellectual understanding. It's an emotional impact. I think, uh, was it you, Chester, that talked about the fear? You know, you worry about losing that money. So you want to understand how can you present, how can you get a certain job? so that you can work and yet if you need it what does the safety net the what is the capacity for getting back on benefits look like because it varies a little bit depending on if you're on ssi or ssd and how do you budget and keep track of your money a lot of it's just not will it work but how would it work and having them use their imagination even if they're not working yet to say you know what is it you think you'd like to do what does it pay what if you only did it for this many hours? How, let's look at the numbers and actually showing people what it would look like. Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's so important to have all the information and know all the information, but also that should not stop people from working or at least getting the experience because, you know, once you get your foot in the door, you know, yeah. that's the that's the first step, you know, and a lot of people don't want to work, but see, that's actually helping, you know, Social Security out because, you know, their main purpose is not to have people, you know, work or, you know, collect, you know, their benefits. So it's so important to get the information out there. One, the one last question that i want to ask you is do you have a lot of people that you work with or you advise that you know sometimes they have the job coaches what are some yeah. of the you know benefits and what are some of the barriers that you see that you okay well that's a very good way to place it chester like the benefits and and barriers so a benefit about having a job coach, um, if especially, is that a job coach can actually be a special work incentive to reduce your countable earnings. It's called subsidy. It's a very um, challenging bit of calculation. But let's say Johnny has a job coach for a certain number of hours a week. You factor in what Johnny's job coach earns, you run it through this calculation, and then you actually say, well, because uh, worker David has Johnny job coaching him during this these periods, David's not actually earning X, Y, and Z money. He's actually just earning X. 
So that's it's it's a very special work incentive that can benefit you. It also on a, on another level, uh, it's a, it's an advisor. It's a go between and a mediator between you and the the boss. Uh, it's someone that can help work out compromises if that's difficult for you. I I've uh, did a three way with a gentleman who was uh, working at a Panera, and in order for him to focus, he wanted to have both earbuds in while he was working in the kitchen doing the dishes, and some of that was his anxiety, but that they felt that was a safety concern, and they weren't going to let him do that. So with some leverage, we talked about, could he just wear one? So the job coach having the relationship with the boss was really helpful in making that happen. Now, the negatives can be that Johnny wants more hours at Panera, and the job coach suddenly becomes not available. Um, some of that's because the job seems stable. When, the, when a job is really stable and a person's just ready to move on, sometimes that takes more for the person with a disability to really work with the agency where the job coach is hired to say, this has been great, I've been here, he's kind of faded, but I need to either have a job developer if it's a separate person, or I want to revisit this, because just because I've been at, in this example, Panera, for six months, I want to make more money or I want to do other work. And so sometimes it's dealing with the delay when you've become used to that helper role of a person who may not be on the same page as you timeline wise. I still have a job coach and my job coach is very helpful to me because sometimes the stuff I have to do, I have difficulty understanding the nuances of how thing right. needs to be done. It's good to have that second pair of eyes uh -huh, uh -huh. guiding you through what you need to do to complete the task. And so now, how does somebody go about finding a benefits advisor if somebody is looking for a job? Hopefully after this wonderful interview, people will step forward and go, I can get a job. I can at least try to see if if I'm employable, how does somebody go about finding a benefits advisor? Well, there's a couple of ways these days. Of course, independent living centers, many of them have a benefits advisor on staff. So our center, the Independent Living Center of the Hudson Valley has myself, the Capital District Center for Independent Living, which is Albany County and parts of Schenectady. I'm sure they have a staff member that's been educated that does this. Uh, you can certainly go directly to Social Security. Um, but if you want a more neutral party or someone to advocate for you, I, I do, of course, recommend independent living centers. Now, an interesting way to get help is suppose you have a social worker or someone in your life that, that functions this way. You can go through this online platform called Unite Us. That's where I get some of my referrals. And I actually get referrals from all over New York State uniquely, mostly the capital region and, and uh, Saratoga County. Um, but, and Schenectady and Albany and Columbia and Green. <laughs> but uh, it's an online platform called Unite Us where uh, social workers are inter-networked. So actually for almost any issue that you may need, and I don't know if consumers can self-refer, I'm gonna check on that. But it's a way that if you have uh, a need, you can connect through them and they will email on your behalf and refer to a benefits advisor that's in your region so that you're reached out to by that person. It's a pretty interesting system. Nice. Any final thoughts for our audience to encourage them to go out and find something that makes them makes them happy, makes them feel they have value having a job? Any well, final first words? of all, yeah. I, I think I I think it's really important to just it, it can be really scary to go back to work when you've been on um, disability. I was, uh, when the time that I was on after I had broken my back, and then as I was getting better and dealing with um, some depression, mostly honestly, because I wasn't working, um, I started volunteering. And no one likes to work for free, but it was a way of getting me out there. The old fashioned term is work hard. So if you think to yourself, geez, I, I really like animals. You might talk to your local vet and say, could I come a couple of hours and help? And even whatever way, even cleaning the cages, or is there? Can I do some filing if you're thinking of doing office work? Definitely, you could apply for job coaching, job development services through either Access VR or the Commission for the Blind. 
and you have every right to have that money distributed on your behalf. So then you're partnering and having a wider team of people to help you look. And there's really cool work incentives that Access VR has, like a work tryout where they will pay an employer six months of wages for you to work there. They have to hire a job developer to do it. It's not always the individual uh, VR counselor. So that if you thought, well, I can't apply there, they might not want me. First of all, always try. Of course they may want you. Because we just don't know our own worth sometimes. So you can get these helpers like VR with these special programs. Talk to people that you know, your family, your friends, um, anyone that you really trust and know and like. And if they're working somewhere that you want to work, ask them, hey, is there an opening there? I've, I've had people when I worked at VR that got their own jobs, but they needed help to keep the jobs. So it's kind of piecing together the, the, the courage to do it, the believing in yourself, partner with someone who believes in you. Trust, if someone who believes in you and saying, I, I can do this and it's okay to get refreshed and say, hey, mom or dad, or hey, brother John, or hey, um, my best friend, Mary, um, what do you think? I, I, think I, I think I would really enjoy working in barns because my grandpa has horses. And I, do you have any jobs at that barn where you work? Or could I come hang out with you? And what do you think? Do you think I could do it? So, so kind of refresh yourself that way. Get some support to take that step. Yes. And I yeah. volunteered a lot before getting my job at OPWDD. I volunteered a lot before I figured out advocacy was what I wanted to do for a career. So I relate to the story you just told. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, BJ. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming in. You have provided oh. us with a lot of information and I hope everyone out there learned something and that, you know, they will decide to go to work. But Sanam, thank you so much for coming and thank explaining you. it to us. And hopefully we'll be able to have you back. And well, thanks, thanks. Chester. Yes. And thanks everyone for listening and hope to see you next time on our next podcast. Accessing Life is a podcast produced by the New York State Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, known as OPWDD. The producer is Michael Orzel. Your hosts are Chester Finn and BJ Stasio. To learn more about the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, supports, and services, go to opwdd.ny.gov.